I'd like to introduce David Schwartz. He's the founder and creative partner from Hush. He's flown in from America uh, to be with us today. He is an award-winning creative leader from the Hush Design Agency. He spent his career designing brand experiences that integrate content, architecture, and technology. After graduating from the Art Center School of Design, he's worked for notable studios, interactive agencies, and design firms in Los Angeles and New York. And since founding Hush, he has developed numerous projects across sport, luxury, beauty, technology, and entertainment categories for companies like Google, Nike, Sonus, Uber, amongst other of the world's leading companies. He's been featured in numerous publications, and he's been involved in the New Museum Incubator Program in New York, and some of the very lovely uh, stuff that's going on trying to mass distribute the uh, science-based micro-museums. It's a very interesting trend in that. And I think you'll find him also to be a compassionate person who's trying to understand how best that the smart buildings can serve all of us. David, can I bring you up? Thank you. No shaking hands. <laughs> no, no. no handshakes, just a bump. Hi. Does this work? Can you hear me? Yeah. Great. I'll wait to my, oh, there you go. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, and I'm pleased to kind of go first or second uh, of this conference. Um, I'm either going to tell you a bunch of great stuff that you've never heard or never thought about, or I'm going to completely waste your time. But it's OK, because it's not that long. Um, I'm not going to talk about technology. I'm not going to talk about engineering. I'm not going to talk about architecture. I don't do any of those things specifically. So if you're here for that, I'm sorry in advance. What I'm going to talk about is sort of the human factor, right? Uh, maybe this is something you can bring with you to every other uh, session you do for the rest of the conference, because I think it's a very broad thought into what smart buildings are, how people relate to them as inhabitants, and how we interact and learn. And I'm going to use a case study uh, of a project we recently did in, uh, in the US. So here's what we're going to do. I'm going to kind of tell you how we think as a firm, my company. And I think that'll create a little bit of a foundation for you to understand how we enter projects, like the project I'll show you. And then I'll think about how experience design, which is our service ultimately, um, really intersects with smart buildings. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about the Unisphere project specifically, which is a project we did uh, just outside of Washington, DC a year or so ago, uh, which is a net zero, a site net zero building. And then maybe we have something to, to take away, OK? So Hush is an experienced design firm. This is the worst language anyone could ever use to describe someone's company. And I, I know it. So it's probably even uh, worse for you. Uh, it's it's not very valuable, but it means something very specific to us. And we do experience design for some of the most interesting companies, I think, in the world. Um, these companies are the ones that Bob mentioned, but you know, big companies with big brands, they have big messages to say, and uh, they have a really unparalleled level of scale and complexity in their business. So our job is often to take those complexities, whether it's in the built environment or other, and help people figure out what they are and clean up the messages. So specifically, we use tons of creative technology, and we help these spaces that people inhabit, whether it's workplace or um, corporate uh, uh, real estate, and we help them communicate to inhabitants in ways that are just simple and direct and human. And I bet, I don't know all of your jobs and fields, but just by looking at the speaker list and the subject matter, it can get very technical and very detailed very quickly. And we actually, our, our, our mission, our passion is to not do that, is to take the complexity of technology and simplify it into ways that everyone can understand. 
So I guess I spend a lot of time thinking about people and the way people operate in space. You know, people, the way they move in transit, the way they move in cities, the way they interact with technologies in their own pockets while they're moving, how space affects them, makes them feel at every step of a journey. And we look a lot at that, and we research a lot about that. So we've done work for Google in their headquarters to help their employees understand um, how Google ticks and their guests. We've done work, are doing work for Uber in their headquarters in San Francisco, helping them express what Uber actually is and does and stands for in the world. Uh, we've worked with large finance companies to translate their workforce into visualizations that motivate people. We've worked with large real estate companies to share what they do and to figure out how people can move from public transit to private commercial space in a beautiful, seamless way. So simply, our world lives at the center of these three things. A message, an idea, a vision, a mission, a passion. In space, three-dimensional space, mediated, informed by, augmented by technology. That's it. If we're not in the dead center, we have nothing to do with the project. We have no value. We shouldn't be there. And as such, we organize our teams like this. Now, I have to say, I'm not a great one of any of these. I'm just a representative of a lot of great people we have at our company thinking in these ways simultaneously. And I think if you don't think in these three ways simultaneously all the time, you're going to miss on what you're trying to do. If you overly make something overly technical, it's not understood. There's no message. If you design something that's so fetishizing the spatial details, you don't understand what you're actually trying to say, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm here to talk about experience design for smart buildings in this particular case. Um, and experience design for me is sort of this weird space, I'm using that in quotes, uh, between architecture and the technical systems that you all know and develop. It's the space between high-end engineering of buildings and the software that's powering those buildings to be green or smart or net zero, which we know about, but not many other people know about. It's the space between the thought around materiality of a space and the digital layers beneath the surface, right? You think about digital is actually another type of material. So let's think about this intersection and how spaces we occupy, this space, the buildings you all work on, are powered by data. I mean, they're massive, massive data sources that can use for be used for functional purposes to understand how the building's performing, but many other things as well. And so in the end, like, I always love this dichotomy. It's, we think about experience design as much about the space you're inside of and how it makes you feel, and the people that occupy that space and their relationship to digital and experiential layers. So constantly, we've had opportunities to really make those two environments talk to each other really beautifully. So people are always hearing from their environment, but in the, in the right volume is, I think, the best way to describe it. Buildings and people, buildings and people. If I want you to remember one thing, it's buildings and people. Um, so why is this space in between important? You know, smart buildings and their inhabitants are interdependent. We all know this, but we really need to know this. If the people in a building aren't really interested, motivated, or aware of the building's behaviors, it's going to be harder to reach to sustainability goals. So we need to tune people's understanding of their built environment so that they, together with the building, perform better. So that's why this is really critical. That's why experience design in smart buildings is even more important than just buildings in general. There's been tons of reports, and, but just looking at one in the last year, if we're going to solve any kind of sustainability goals, it has to be about changing human behavior. 
we have to walk out of this room and change the micro actions we do every day. Inhabitants of buildings, employees, visitors, they have to change their micro actions every day to work in tune with the building to reach a sustainability goal. So there's so many ways to do this. Emotional appeal, social incentives, but it doesn't really matter. I'm gonna focus on three that drove this Unisphere project I'm gonna show you, but there's tons of models of behavioral change we know, but I'm gonna look at social, which is how people perform in a group, what we do together and why we do it. Motivational, which is like why, what incentivizes you to do that extra 10%? Why would you do it anyway? And then educational, it's like, if you know more, you will make better decisions, that's a fact. So right now, this is your world of expertise, so I'm sort of, I'm, I'm just an observer. I don't think the means of behavioral change that exist in smart buildings right now are very effective. The buildings themselves are incredibly innovative and performing better and better, but me as an employee, I don't know anything about smart buildings. I'm just going to work every day. Or as a guest, I just go to work every day. I just visit someone. These plaques mean nothing. They mean nothing. They might as well be a picture of my son on the wall. So the, the plaques are visible to the public, but they're not understood, okay? On the flip side, you have building systems tools and dashboards. They help operators figure out how to optimize buildings, read the data, and make minute-to-minute -minute decisions. But there's tons of data, they're too complicated for the average person to understand the value or to change their behavior, and also they're not visible. They're often hidden in control rooms, and if they're visualized in any way for people in, an, in, a, in a workspace, um, no one even understands what they are. So the opportunity at hand that I would hope that you would believe in is that we can design ways for smart buildings to tell more human, emotional stories that better influence people and their behavior through those mechanisms of behavioral change. And then smart buildings as a result, their environments will perform even better and will have a greater impact on sustainability. So that's my entire thesis, is just let's stop throwing data at people and let's communicate with the people in a built environment in a way that you and I all talk to each other as human beings, not as experts or technologists or engineers. Does that sound good or no? Okay. But how? I don't know. Um, so I'm going to take you just through this project. It's going to be tons of visual stuff. I figure everyone likes pretty pictures and designs and things. So. I'm gonna just show you how we thought about this project. It, it'll give you a little insight into how our firm thinks and then how we came up with the final experience design of the Unisphere. So the, 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 the company is called United Therapeutics. It's a biotech company just outside of Washington, D.C. It's about a four or five billion dollar company, not enormous. It was founded by Martine Rothblatt. You should Google her TED Talk, it's one of the most viewed TED Talks ever. She's a phenomenal CEO, an incredible person. And building a new building on her campus, she said, if we're gonna build a new building, we're gonna figure out a way to do it with the most innovative technologies possible. That's just her, everything she does is at that level. It doesn't matter what the subject matter is. If she was designing a car, it would be the same thing. So that was the goal. And the goal is visualize the energy of sustainability in the building, connect the people inside the building um, in meaningful ways to create behavioral change. She wanted to create behavioral change in her own workforce, okay? So again, it, this is right outside of Washington DC, which any of you know, the weather there, it's not Southern California. It's highs and lows, deep winters, hot summers, it's a very difficult place to do site net zero. Again, you're the experts. I only know from our work here. But um, site net zero, everything on site is there, generating as much solar power as it's consuming on a yearly basis. They had to pass incredible laws, new drilling uh, uh, variances, insane engineering feats and political feats, but they did it. 
so the building is interesting. Uh, I don't think uh, it's particularly aesthetic, but it's really created by a lot of amazing engineering techniques, um, full solar arrays, uh, heat stacking, um, uh, cooling inside, and ultimately it's uh, composed of three areas that we focused on. The first is the atrium, which is the central volume. All of the workforce looks into this atrium, and that's important. I'm going to tell you why in a second. The second are the hallways that people transit every day. This is where people intersect, communicate, and then the exhibition is everywhere. So those three areas are going to drive the behavioral changes that we looked for in social ways, in motivational ways, in educational ways. And so they're scattered among in this section, which I'll show you. So the atrium is the central volume. It's the centerpiece for social change. Why? Everyone goes through it. It's the lobby. It's the place of cultural interaction. Everyone at their desks looks out over the central atrium, so they see that space every day, out of the corners of their eyes, in passing, when they turn, etc. So it's the focal point. And this volume became a very interesting space for us to, to explore. And frankly, it was the focal point of our project. We took a lot of inspiration from the sun. Makes sense, right? Um, the sun is our biggest energy producer in this planet, and it does a lot of other things from a, a human standpoint. The sun has always done a lot of interesting things. It marks the passage of time. We don't need to be told to look at the sun. You know when it's noon. You know when it's the hottest point of the day. We've always responded to the slow change in the light's direction or heat. That's a pretty amazing way to communicate with people in a way that's not informational, leveraging the sun. So sun and light was a core theme to bring people together with the building. And the sun as passage of time was also another way. So thinking about this idea of this building as a environment in which the data constantly ebbs and flows, much like the sun rises and sets and the temperature rises and, and lowers, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, that's how buildings perform, right? It's a sign curve. So we started to look at that sign curve and say, hey, if people could understand how the building's performing over a given day, they would have a more of a connection to it, much like they always had a connection to the natural elements. So we started to explore. Now, you, it's kind of interesting, right? We're designing experiences for a building, three-dimensional, highly technical, and we're starting with simple, almost childish tests. But these tests reveal that there's a lot of ways to share with a workforce who doesn't know anything about engineering or building data or smart buildings. They just know about being a human being. To share with them what's happening inside the building. So we sketch and we sketch some more. And then we start to get a little bit higher fidelity and we start to realize that we can communicate the building's performance in very simple ways that remind people what they need to do. Is the building generating more energy or less energy? Is it a hot day that everything's working overtime or is everything stable? So simple, simple visualizations with no numbers, no facts, no interface, just this idea of the movement of, these, of this light. And so we started to think how that could be even more beautiful and craft it even nicer and be a visualization for everyone to see. And we started to work on these tests. And then at the same time, we're looking at the data of the building. So we're getting sample data sets from the building uh, models, data models, and we're running them through this experience and we're saying, okay, cool, we have the data, maybe we can turn it into these things that have instant understanding. And then we start to engineer and ultimately in this we engineered a lot of light tests and we looked at materiality and we looked at integration with the building and we looked at reflections and refractions and optics and we tested the way things moved via simple techniques versus motor, motor control systems. And at the end, we had a pretty interesting concept 
that we knew with actually really old technology. <laughs> this is just mirrors and a light like that that you can dim. Old, old technology, high, high modern technology in terms of the data and software, but being pushed into old, old technology, but in ways that mean something to the people in the building. And we were able to design this called the energy dial, which is a 40 foot uh, radius uh, experience in the space that everyone sees all day. And it reminds them of what the building's doing and how they should be behaving to optimize the sustainability goals. Okay, that's one. That's social change. That's communal change. This is the hall. How do you motivate behavioral change? You motivate it through uh, exposing the energy from within the building to people at a higher fidelity. So that you allow people to explore with more detail. In the previous atrium space, they couldn't do anything. You're just looking, which is okay, because that told them a, a smart piece of information without distracting them. Now all of a sudden we can interact with the past, present, and future of the building's energy. We were inspired by this idea that the building itself is this data-rich structure, but you can't see it. When you walk in, even if it's the most high-tech building in the world, you don't know, it looks like this, right? We love this idea that we could peel away the facade of the building or the walls of the building and peer inside and look at the data inside. So we started to look at all these ways we might do that. And we started to look at something we could design that really looked like it opened the building up and exposed the live data moving inside of it. And these are just design tests. This is how we work. Iterate, 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 iterate. And looking at materiality, could the data show up as light through material? It's as if people are peering through a window into the innermost guts of the building, understanding that there's data inside. And the movement of that might be really beautiful and people might be able to interact with that so they have more of a relationship to the building and its data. We built some cool interface studies in which you could actually play with the data of the building and all of its systems that generate power as well as huge power, and how that might express itself through the physical space of the building. This is just a fun little test. The interface is really beautiful. I think interface is a lot of ways to get people to understand something. Um, this is the way we take really complex data and make it simple to understand. So this is people playing with uh, all the real-time data of the building, of the past, how it's performing in the present, and you can even model future behaviors of the building based on environmental scenarios and see how that would play out in terms of the data. So we're giving people a very simple interface in which they can experience complex data. Lastly, we call it the exhibition. The exhibition flows throughout the entire building. Um, it's real education, it's real understanding of all the terms of what net zero means, what sustainability means in terms of the built environment, and it's not overwhelming. It's small micro doses of information that you catch on your way to the bathroom. You go to a meeting, there's another little piece of information. It's all sprinkled throughout the space. So all these environmental graphics simply break down the complexity of how a net zero building actually works. And it's meant to be a backdrop for you to have a conversation, talk to a peer, you have a guest or a partner visiting, you have subject matter that we all educate up. So there's hundreds of these things around the space as environmental graphics, et cetera. So in the end, we have this three-part system. Um, we have this big atrium piece we have this hall piece where you can actually begin to explore. And then we have these beautiful messaging systems around the whole space, the exhibition where you understand the details of net zero. And they all work together at the right volume, at the right level, in the right space. And I think that's the key to the work we do, is that we're not trying to do everything all the time. We're trying to provide layers of experience that allow people to understand the message of a building at the right moment. So I'm gonna just show you the case study of this. It's just two minutes long. Just making sure the sound is good. 
and I think it shows you a little bit more of how it feels to be in the space. done but the I just I like this image because it, in a way I mean he's an actor so you know but but imagine this was the employee I like the idea that this isn't a lot of work you just kind of see it and you learn something and know something and you commune with the building and I think that's really important so I think we're hoping to strive to create these kinds of things in buildings all over the world so that the buildings can communicate better with their inhabitants. Thank you. Thank you, David, that was wonderful. Thanks. I've explained to all my speakers that of all the conferences here at ISE, our smart building audience tends to be the most vocal and interactive. So I'm hoping you're not gonna let me down today. But I'm gonna start off with a first question, if you don't mind, maybe because one of the things I'm interested in is you're doing this cutting edge experiential project in, in, a, in a cutting edge smart building. To get to where you ended up, what was the process with the stakeholders? Who did you have to sell? Who did you have to talk to? Who did you have to, to woo in order to get to the final project and get it signed off and approval? Okay. Um, okay. Well, in any of these projects that we do, we clearly have to have a high-level stakeholder who believes in the value of communicating this information to their people. If no one cares and it's a purely functional endeavor, we don't really exist. But for Martine Rothblatt, the CEO, she said, this is a value. We're putting millions of dollars into the building beyond a normal building. If we're not using that as a value to show our employees or our prospective employees, potential hires, partners, the press and media, if we're not using this investment as a tool, we're crazy. So it came from her, but then, you know, very quickly, you really need to have high, high level stakeholders in workplace, real estate workplace, and in technical and IT systems. If you don't have that, and then the architectural partner involved and open and collaborative, you reach a lot of loggerheads that don't get fixed quickly. So those are generally the three Same organizations. And, and just to follow up on that, was the communication where all three would be in the same room at the same time, or would you have to tackle them in separate sequential that's a great question, and this is something that we do with all of our projects. Yeah. Um, 
Martine's very hard to to get in a room. She's yeah. busy flying around, you know, growing brains and pigs and making drones deliver organs to people. It's crazy. But we did have her at key moments. Okay. But we had to have technology, architecture, and workplace always together, in always same. in the same room yeah. making decisions. That, that's a very significant point, I think. Okay, who has a question for David or would like to ask a little bit about the project? Yes. Thanks very much. Thank you. That was very good, uh, David, thank you. If you, you. Uh, Just yeah. give your name, James and, sure. and company, for the folks. James from Memory Research. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting um, answer to the, the question there about um, you know, having client buy-in. Yeah. Um, and I, in, in some ways, I think that's the, you know, the fantastic and like the gold standard of what everyone really wants, but it's not common. Yes. Um, so do you think then that there's like a structural problem with the, with smart buildings? Like, is there, um, you know, if we can only, if we can only deliver smart buildings in projects like this, um, what does that, what does that mean? So I think your question is, um, in order to deliver smart buildings better in the future, will it require a certain type of organizational agreement in clients? Well, is that I, fair? I think what he's referring to is a super rich client with a very <laughs> focused, kind of a rare bird as opposed to a, a flocker. Is that right, but James? Like, a bit of both, but but yeah. yeah. So okay. I mean, you know, if we're gonna if we're gonna move from you know just big single projects to like mass market adoption, yeah. what, what would you recommend as being like a, a change? I mean, it's a, it's a huge question and I feel almost unprepared to answer it, but I can tell you this project was an anomaly in terms of having such high level focus on it. And the scale of this company is, is something, but it's not Google or, you know, right? So you have a, it's a scale thing. Um, I think if, the, if companies aren't organized properly for this kind of work, it gets very difficult to do it. Because some part of the organization is out front making decisions that the other two entities need to figure out. And if architecture is purely driving decision making, none of the experiential smart elements necessarily get added to that project or visible to people in the appropriate way. They might be added from an engineering standpoint, but not from a message or experience standpoint. Um, if technology is driving and architecture is not, then it doesn't quite come together in the right way. So I think it's an alignment issue, which will be better with awareness over time. Um, that being said, we've watched projects we've done die because of that misalignment. So I think aligning stakeholders, but hopefully my presentation is helping us all figure out a way to articulate that there's a value here in exposing this kind of work. And the C-suite of companies need to understand that value better. And then these things will come together more. So it's like a messaging problem first and then a corporate organization problem second. If I, I, I like that New York answer that, <laughs> what? Yeah, that you wouldn't necessarily be prepared to, yeah. to answer that. It's very yeah. honest and very good from you know, that point of view. Just, just to focus on that for a second more, James, I think to some degree we're at the stage where we need some of these rare birds to create examples and then the rest of us go away and try to figure out how to, how to do it on our scale, whatever that scale is and we don't necessarily match up with the attention of a sophisticated New York agency on the experiential, but the history of the high tech is that eventually people bring it down to the level and people find ways to simulate it and perhaps not do it in the same level, but they try to move you towards it, so looking forward to that. Questions for David? Yes, in the front here, we're gonna bring you our catch box. She's going to hand it to you instead of throwing it at you, which is very lucky. For I appreciate it. Hi, Sophie Bernie from Accenture. Hi. Um, I'm quite keen since the whole point was to bring the value back to the occupants. 
what was their response in the end? Because I'm that kind of missing that. <laughs> well, this was shot before the, the before they even moved in. So our timing's a little off to answer that question, but if I can get your card or something, I'll follow up. We're doing qualitative studies now with the client, but it hasn't been long enough. You know, this was all this was all like the day after delivery before there was anyone even there. But they're inhabiting the building, right? It's hard to know what baseline is versus improved, but there's all sorts of qualitative metrics about workplace environment. Uh, attachment to mission, understanding of a um, of vision around sustainability, these kinds of things. I think in six months or 12 months, I'm going to have a nice set of least qualitative responses to be able to answer that better. Let's Political answer, but a real answer. <laughs> um, one more question in the front, please. This is a follow up for the previous question. When Martina had this vision, what's her expectation? What, how does she see the return from all this work? It's a similar question. I think Martine is very comfortable in the qualitative value of things. She understands that if she's going to do something, she's going to do it at the highest level. She's an explorer. She's an innovator. She is a moonshot person. And those people don't necessarily need to see ROI instantly. But I know she knows it because her desire was, I want to have the most tuned workforce of anyone. I want to have people who understand sustainability better and are working towards it. And I want to hire people who want to work in an environment that thinks about these themes all the time. And I think even without research and metrics yet, she can check those boxes. Time for one more question, if someone has another question about Unisphere. I, I think you've answered some questions there. Cool. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll shake your hand again, Thanks. because I know it's from New York. <laughs> cool.